So I do think we will have a recession. Uh, my view has been very consistent. I've been in the this time is longer camp rather than the this time is different camp. But this time is longer means the recession might not occur until, say, the end of next year, which is still longer than what most people are anticipating. What is the Fed's next move after this week's decision to raise the Fed funds rate by 25 basis points? Well, that is a question on everyone's mind. We'll be discussing this issue along with investment implications and the outlook for global growth with our next guest, Peter Berezin. He is the director of research and the chief global strategist at BCA Research. Prior to working at BCA Research, Peter served as a senior global economist with Goldman Sachs and as a researcher at the International Monetary Fund, IMF. Thank you, Peter, for joining me today. Welcome to the David Lynn Report. Pleasure hosting you. Good to be back on. The Fed raised interest rates by 25 basis points, uh, much to nobody's surprise, but let's talk about forward guidance. Jerome Powell was very clear in uh, making it his stance that the Fed will be data dependent and data driven. What data does he need to look at before making the decision to either hike again or pause? Well, he's going to be looking at sort of data that will determine the path of uh, growth and inflation. So he's focused on labor market developments. He's focused on housing. He's focused on the manufacturing sector. It's focused on financial conditions, which have been easing of late. So if the data continue to come in strong, it might not be possible for the Fed to remain on hold. I think the market is getting a little bit bit ahead of itself in pricing in rate cuts for next year. Uh, We will get that if we had a recession, but at this point, recession is hardly a done deal for the next 12 months. Okay, we're going to get to that. I I, want to get your take on why you think a uh, recession is hardly a done deal. The, the The question people have on their minds is whether or not Powell is done hikes for now. Um, you know, if you had to make a bet, which side would you take? Um, it, it's a close call, but certainly relative to market expectations, I would take the view that uh, more hikes ought to be priced in than what has been uh, price, price, priced in. Because when I look at the data, I just don't see a heck of a lot of softening in the numbers. In fact, if anything, you could quite easily point in the direction of the data firming up rather than weakening. Are you seeing any signs of a repeat of 2008 um, in terms of economic growth, a recession, downturn in the housing market, so on and so forth? Well, quite the contrary, I would say. Uh, The housing market has been showing signs of resilience. Uh, building permits have been rising since last December. That's a good leading indicator for uh, residential investment. Now, in Q2, residential investment did shrink by 4, 4.2%, which was, I believe, the ninth quarter of uh, declines in home building. But given the, numbers, given, given the numbers on building permits, given the numbers on home builder confidence, which is moving higher and higher every, every, every month, Given the numbers on home prices, which are rising again, you know, the housing market looks as though it's bottoming out and will start to recover. So that's hardly like hardly like uh, 20, 2008. I want to talk about uh, the economy and your recession or no recession outlook, whatever camp you may be in. Uh, the consumer first, the index of consumer sentiment by the uh, published by the University of Michigan. There's a few of them. I'm looking at the Michigan index. That's been trending up ever since the beginning of the year. Doesn't seem to be stopping this trend. What's driving this uptick in consumer confidence, at least for this year? Well, I think it's a number of things. Uh, one, <clears throat> inflation is coming down. And so real wages are starting to grow again, uh, especially in the University of Michigan survey, that surge inflation that we saw had a very depressing effect on confidence, but that seems to be reversing. And then, as I mentioned, you know, home prices are rising again. People are feeling happier about that. And the labor market just remains very strong. Unemployment is exceptionally low. We got the initial claims data this morning another decline. Continuing claims have been trending lower for a couple of months now. So again, the, the economy just looks very, very robust. Well, that's um, 
something I've been wondering is whether or not consumer confidence could be an indicator at all for the strength of the labor market. People know best whether or not they're in a good position to be either laid off next or uh, or may, they may have a sense or getting a raise or how well they're doing at work. And if sentiment is good, does that could that indicate that they're also feeling good about their job prospects? They are. And you can see that in a number of dimensions. So if you look at the quits rate, you know, the share of workers that quit their jobs every month, that's kind of a good measure of uh, worker confidence. It's a good measure of how much bargaining power workers feel they have with employers. That ticked higher in the last uh, reading. Uh, and also, if you look at th- that kind of conference board survey that comes out every month, there's a set of questions around how easy it is that respondents think it is to find a job these days. And what we've seen is that the share of respondents who think it's easier to find a job started to go back up again, um, which, is, which is important because A, it means that confidence is rising, and B, that particular series, the spread between those who think jobs are easy to find versus those who think that they're hard to get, has good leading indicators good leading in leading uh, properties for wage growth. And of course, wage growth has been coming down, but given the drop in uh, the uh, given 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 the pickup in worker confidence, that you know does raise the risk that wage growth could start to reaccelerate. That's something that the Fed is very much focused on. Uh, does a reacceleration of wage growth necessarily mean higher CPI overall? Over time, it does. Now, now, I mean, the caveat is that, as I mentioned earlier, real wages got really hit during the surge inflation. And in level terms, just look at the level of wages. In real terms, they're still about 3% below the pre-pandemic trend. So you could have a situation where inflation comes down, but nominal wage growth doesn't need to come down quite as much because you've got to make up for the shortfall in real wage growth over the last 12 months. But again, that's a bit of a problem for the Fed because if real wage growth accelerates, and there's a close link between real wages and consumer spending, strong real wage growth will lead to more spending, which could lead to a pickup in inflation. And so the irony here is that Falling inflation could, in some sense, sow the seeds of its own demise by pushing up those real wages. I know several years ago you were talking about how low unemployment could eventually lead to a recession. Can you can you walk us through the logic here? Well, if you look at the U.S. unemployment rate, it's an incredibly mean reverting series. It's either going up or going down. And when it gets down to very low levels... You can sort of putter around there for like, you know, 12 months, 24 months, but usually it starts rising. And the reason it starts rising is it's just because it's very difficult to keep the economy at full employment. When you're in full employment, anything that boosts demand will start to push up inflation. You know, that's what we saw during the uh, pandemic when the economy began to reach full employment. That requires Fed tightening, which can have an negative effect on growth. Conversely, at full employment, anything that reduces spending, anything that starts to push up unemployment could very easily feed on itself. So it's a, it's, a, it's an unstable equilibrium in some respects, which is why historically when unemployment gets to low levels, it eventually starts rising. So I do think we will have a recession. Uh, my view has been very consistent. I've been in the this time is longer camp rather than the this time is different camp. But this time is longer means the recession might not occur until, say, the end of next year, which is still longer than what most people are anticipating. I I have to bring up the yield curve. The yield curve has historically been inverted for up to a year uh, before we officially get a recession, or at least the gray bars that the NBER designate. It hasn't happened yet. It's been more than a year, Peter. Why has this why has this time around been longer than previous cycles? Well, the, the yield curve is a good leading indicator for the economy, but it's almost like too good a leading indicator because often it takes more than 12 months for an inverted yield curve to uh, translate into a recession. It's important to keep in mind that an inverted yield curve doesn't directly mean that a recession is coming. All an inverted yield curve really says is that the market expects the Fed to cut 
rates. Now we could have a very benign scenario where the where the Fed cuts rates, not because the economy is falling into recession, but because inflation goes down. If that's the case, an inverted yield curve wouldn't signal a recession. I'm not so <laughs> sanguine. Like I said, I think we will have a recession. But but keep in mind that a lot of people have been anticipating recession for a very long time. So the yield curve probably inverted earlier than it would have normally had this not been the most anticipated recession uh, in history. <laughs> That's absolutely true. And in fact, um, if you look at uh, the Fed's own projections of a recession by next year using the yield curve, it's like 70 something percent. Um, we have to talk about also the uh, advanced Q2 GDP numbers that came out today on Thursday, 2.4%, um, which is slightly up from 2%, the consensus estimates. How are you reading this number? Is it, is it, is it a good number overall in terms of uh, signaling strength in the economy? Yeah, it's a pretty good number. Uh, I mean, trend growth is probably around 1.8, 1.9%. So we've got above trend growth. That's good in the sense that it means that a recession is not uh, imminent. But, you know, the Fed doesn't want growth to be too strong. So, again, we get this sort of balancing act, this uh, needle that the Fed needs to thread. It's kind of hard. They want growth to be good but not but not uh, great. And as I mentioned, you know, housing actually made a negative contribution to growth in Q2. That's probably the last negative contribution that housing will will uh, make because the uh, data on uh, building permits suggests that we're going to get a pickup in, in in construction activity. That that's interesting. Uh, why why would why would there be a pickup in construction activity? Is is the um, construction industry anticipating higher demand? They are, yeah. You can see that from the uh, home builder uh, surveys that come out every, every month. Uh, you know, prices are rising, and usually home builders uh, build more homes when prices go up. And also, you know, it's important to remember that we've had about 15 years now where U.S. home builders have failed to keep up with household formation. And as a consequence, the homeowner vacancy rate, the share of homes that are vacant, no one is living there. No one is renting them. It's down to around 1%, which is the lowest number in history. And the average age of U.S. homes has got gotten up to about 31 years, which is the highest since 1949. So, so we have a lot of shortages of homes. And when that's the case, that really puts a bottom under home building. Are you surprised that demand for homes is rising during a time when interest rates remain elevated, mortgage rates are higher than what they were two years ago? I mean, it's a pri- I guess that's a, I would say it's, it's, a, it's surprising in the, in the sense that mortgage rates have increased a lot and uh, demand for homes has stayed robust despite that. It's not surprising in the sense that demand is strong in environment where most people still have a job and real income growth is starting to pick up. And the other point to really keep in mind when it comes to housing is that the U.S. mortgage market is dominated by 30-year fixed rate mortgages. So if you look at the average, uh, if you look at the average mortgage rate that homeowners are paying, it's lower today than it was in 2019 because so many homeowners refinanced their mortgages during the pandemic when rates were low. So you don't have a situation where a lot of people have sort of been forced out of their homes because they can't pay their mortgage anymore, causing a lot of supply to hit the market. Most people are actually okay because they're locked into those low rates. Interesting. Let's talk about inflation. Now, you've published several charts showing the decline of the inflation rate and why you think this trend will continue, meaning inflation will go lower still. Uh, and I'll put these charts on the screen, one of which is a chart showing a very tight correlation between the core PCE and the NFIB small business survey price plans in the next three months. Now, interestingly, Peter, the uh, core PCE rate, the measure of inflation that's preferred by the Federal Reserve, that's been sticky around 4.6% for months. Why has that been sticky at around this level and not come down? And why do you think it's going to start coming down now? Well, inflation is going to head lower. In fact, if you look at sort of more refined measures of uh, core inflation, those that 
strip out not just food and energy, but also strip out uh, shelter. Uh, you kind of need to strip out shelter because shelter is a very lagging indicator. We know that asking rents aren't rising anymore. We see the data from Zillow and apartment list that leads shelter inflation. So you always almost want to take that out of the equation as well. These more refined measures of inflation, you know, so-called super core measures of inflation have definitely peaked and are coming down. So I don't think there's much of a debate that inflation will fall. Um, at least for the next couple of months. Uh, the question is, A, whether inflation will fall quickly enough for the Fed, and B, whether that decline in inflation can be sustained. Now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there are a lot of forces out there that could lead to resurgence in spending. And if that occurs, then any decline in inflation could be temporary. And I think the Fed is definitely focused on that. Do you think that uh, higher rates are necessary still to accelerate the uh, decline of inflation? Possibly. I mean, we, ju we just don't know. I think we have to be data dependent, like Jay Powell has uh, urged everyone uh, to be. Uh, like on the one hand, like it is pretty clear that some of the lagged effects of tighter monetary policy, tighter bank lending standards have not been felt throughout the economy. And typically bank lending standards lead credit growth by like a year. So credit growth now is starting to slow. Delinquency rates on consumer loans are starting to rise. You know, that process will continue and that will weigh on growth. But, you know, we have the other things that we mentioned, the pickup in housing activity, the increase in real uh, incomes, and possibly, you know, it's not, definitive yet, we could get a bit of a bounce back in some of the manufacturing numbers, which have been very weak now for close to two years. So if that happens, then no, the Fed isn't done raising rates. It'll have to go further. I've been looking at um, several different indices pointing to a slowdown in the global credit impulse. Is that something that you've also looked at? And um, has that been looking according to your data? Uh, has that been slowing down rather according to your data? Yeah, and so that's kind of the one channel uh, of monetary policy that seems to be working properly. Credit growth is uh, slowing, but it's not you know, slowing dramatically. Like during March, when we had these uh, <laughs> commotions associated with uh, the failure of Silicon Valley Bank and a number of other uh, banks, there was a real worry that we wouldn't just have slower credit growth, but we would have a credit credit freeze of the sort that we had in 2008. Now that's looking less uh, less, less likely. Right now, the environment for credit growth for banks in general seems more akin to what we saw in the late 1980s when you had kind of the savings and loan crisis, but it wasn't really kind of a frantic crisis. It took like four years for the failures in the savings and loan industry to culminate in recession. So we have more of a kind of a slow boil process going on with uh, banks. And again, that kind of suggests that we can probably avoid a recession for the next 12 months or so. The IMF came out with their growth forecast for the remainder of the year and 2024 just this week, in fact, two days ago. And I'll just give you a summary. So growth is global growth is projected to fall from an estimated 3.5% in 2022 to 3% in both 2023 and 2024. Uh, the rise in central bank policy rates to fight inflation continued to weigh down on economic activity. Global headline inflation, according to their estimates, is expected to fall from 8.7% to 6.8% in 2023 and 5.2% in 2024. Is this more or less in line with your with your expectations for global growth? Well, you know, I used to work in the IMF yeah, research I, I, that's I used why I, make, asked <laughs> I used to make these forecasts. I mean, I would say they're probably a little bit... Uh, on the pessimistic side relative to what I'm uh, e expecting. I mean, one obvious kind of wild card for global growth is just what happens to uh, China. The housing market there definitely looks very weak, and that's weighing on growth. But the government is doing a bit of stimulus. That could be enough to sort of put a bottom under Chinese growth. And if that happens, then I suspect that growth estimates, which, by the way, this year have generally been moving higher, uh, against very low expectations, there is scope for them to rise further. 
Well, stock indices like the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ have both been on a tear this year. Do you think that higher stock prices are indeed a reflection of an improvement in financial conditions and the health of businesses? Yeah, I mean, it looks as though earnings have basically bottomed. If you look at 12-month forward earnings, uh, they've been trending higher since about February. Uh, 12-month forward sales, by the way, never really even decelerated last last year. So we had this very significant uh, uh, shrinkage in profit margins. At this point, margins are kind of back to where they were in 2019. If the global economy continues to grow and sales will grow and margins are sort of stable here on now, then earnings will probably increase as well. And that'll put a bit of a tailwind behind uh, stocks. You made a tweet about the surplus of financial balances. Can you can you talk us through that logic and how that's related to uh, not just the health of the, the corporate sector, but also the health of the economy? Yeah, I mean, so, so, you know, bottom up stock pickers are aware of this idea of free cash flow. That's the difference between what a company generates in operating profits minus what it spends on uh, capital equipment. And so you can look at kind of free cash flow for the economy as a whole. And, and as it turns out, uh, there hasn't been a case in the post-war era where a recession has begun when in the aggregate free cash flow for the corporate sector uh, was positive. It's always negative. Uh, it is positive today. It's positive to the tune of about 2% of GDP. Now you can say, well, a lot of those a lot of that cash flow is being generated by a small number of tech companies, and there's some truth to that. But I think the bigger picture is that corporate balance sheets are reasonably strong. And in fact, what happened during the pandemic, sort of the opposite of what happened to Silicon Valley Bank, a lot of corporates termed out their uh, loans and refinanced them at very low rates. And now they're not paying very much to service those long-term uh, loans or long-term bonds, but they do have cash and they're earning a lot of money and just by parking that cash in uh, money market funds and, and, and high, higher yielding bank deposits. So that's actually strengthening the corporate sector, which again, sort of this is a theme that we've been talking about for the last uh, few minutes. Uh, the overall health of the US economy is still pretty good. What would, I guess change your mind about the uh, health of the economy? Again, being data dependent like the Fed, what data would you need to look at to make the evaluation that um, a downturn is going to happen sooner than perhaps you initially anticipated? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's just a question of what's what's sort of lying in the woodwork that we don't know about. Uh, so we had the problems with regional banks in March, um, you know, is that the end of these problems? Who knows? You know, we have to be humble in this industry. Certainly, the problems in commercial real estate look pretty significant. It just, you know, no matter how low the price is, nobody can, seems to be able to offload an office tower these days. You know, maybe that leads to some blowups for some banks. So certainly, if the situation in the banking system were to deteriorate that would bring forward the uh, timing of the next recession. But I would also say that on the, on the flip side, if things end up being too good, if inflation starts to reaccelerate, which is a possibility, it's not my base case, but I'm giving that a 20 to 25% probability, then the Fed has to really slam on the brakes and that could lead to recession. It won't happen immediately, but when it does happen, that recession could end up being quite deep, quite quite a bit more deep than if we just sort of slowly, gradually fell into a recession. Given your base case outlook, not your tail end um, probability outlook, but your base case outlook, what are the uh, sectors or areas in the economy that you see have the most investment potential right now? It doesn't have to be just U.S., by the way. Yeah, so... You know, we have a good sector model at BCA. It's done a really nice job of sort of predicting relative sector returns. Right now, the model is actually favoring cyclical sectors. That was the case last year. Uh, but right now, it likes industrials. It likes 
IT, flex consumer discretionary, even warming up to financials now. Uh, but it doesn't like kind of the traditional defensive such as consumer staples, healthcare, and utilities. So right now, with a recession still not imminent, I would be inclined to have more of a cyclical, uh, pro-cyclical bias in my sector allocations. But again, you know, we probably will have a recession at some point. So I'll be looking to get more defensive before then. You wouldn't want to be positioned defensively ahead of a recession, Peter? You want to be positioned defensively ahead of a recession, but not too far ahead. And typically, the stock market peaks about six months before the onset of a recession. So if you're kind of thinking, as I'm thinking, that maybe a recession will start towards the end of next year, you know, that says that we might still have another six, maybe 12 months of upside. Now, I don't think we want to get too cute. Like, you know, if the S&P goes up to... 5,000 will probably turn more defensive. But right now, our kind of short-term models, which have been really helpful in predicting the direction of the stock market, they're still bullish. You wrote a piece um, a while ago about uh, investing in AI. Uh, I believe, if I could sum up your thesis correctly, that um, perhaps it's not the best idea to jump on the bandwagon just yet. Can you, can you summarize this for us? I think you can make some parallels between the dot-com boom and the AI frenzy that we're seeing today. Now, during the dot-com boom, productivity growth began to accelerate around the mid-1990s, and it stayed pretty high right through the mid-2000s, so what about 10 years of strong productivity growth in, induced by the introduction of the internet. But, but what's interesting, kind of ironic, is that just as productivity growth was beginning to fall back down in 2005, that was only when companies were actually figure, figuring out how to effectively monetize the internet. So in other words, the productivity gains from the internet happened well before the profits were earned. And it could be the same story again with AI, that we get you know, a boost to productivity growth from AI, but it takes a number of years for companies to really effectively start making money off. In fact, in the near term, you could almost see the opposite. Like imagine you had like a really good chat bot that could tell you exactly what to do if you wanted to travel from, say, you know, Montreal to New York City. Uh, it would say, well, take this flight on this day, that's the cheapest flight. You know, if that chatbot is objective, it gives you the right answer, then how do you monetize that? Uh, because the airline that offered the cheaper fare wouldn't have an incentive to advertise because the chatbot is objective, at least it's presumed to be objective, and will give you the right answer. Uh, so the irony, irony is that you know companies like Google make a lot of money because their search engines are good, but they're not great. You still have to kind of do that last mile of work clicking on the links, and that's where Google makes the money. If you take that out of the equation, then maybe it actually becomes more difficult in the near term to make money off AI. Um, Goldman Sachs, another firm you worked at, <laughs> uh, predicted 300 million jobs will be affected by AI uh, globally. So is it possible that productivity would have to go up because people are going to be <laughs> laid off and unemployed? And so you've got fewer workers producing similar output. Productivity goes up on paper. I mean, that's, that's what productivity really is all about, producing more output with less labor inputs. I think you know, a critical question is whether those workers who may end up losing their jobs because of AI, whether they'll be able to find jobs uh, elsewhere. And it's not, you know, it's not 100% clear. Again, you can kind of look at history. I mean, look at farming as an example. In the early 20th century, over 50% of uh, US households were employed in agriculture. Now it's down to 2%. You know, what happened? Well, because you had incredible productivity gains in in, 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 in farming, and a lot of people, as a consequence, lost their jobs. Now, they were able to find work elsewhere, uh, but that was because we had other industries that were growing. If AI has this kind of broad-based impact on all industries, then it, 
we could find ourselves in a situation where supply is growing quickly, but demand is really struggling to keep up. And if that were to be the case, then obviously we would need policy that's quite uh, stimulative, both on the fiscal side and the monetary side, whether whether we get that or not, and that would that would remain to be seen. Yeah, uh, I'd be curious to see if uh, the development of AI would be inflationary or deflationary, but time will tell. Excellent, Peter. Thank you very much for a very thorough discussion. Uh, you have an excellent Twitter feed. I'll put the link down in the description below. People should follow Peter. And where else can we learn more about your work and BCA's work? Oh, just visit the BCA website. If you'd like a free trial to our research, uh, we're more than happy to provide that to you. All right. I'll put the link to that as well in the description down below. Thank you very much, Peter, for your time. And we'll speak again Thank soon. You. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe.